Mauthausen concentration camp. It was the largest National Socialist concentration camp on Austrian soil. The scene of crimes against humanity beyond belief. Around 190,000 people were imprisoned here between the years 1938 and 1945. Half of them died. Today, the camp stands as a memorial in remembrance of the terrible crimes committed by the National Socialists. These images, filmed by American troops after the camp's liberation, give an impression of the conditions to which the prisoners were subjected. Montrer un tas de cadavres, c'est horrible. Showing a mountain of corpses is terrible, but it doesn't show life in a concentration camp. Life in a concentration camp means living next to a mountain of corpses, as if they were no more than perhaps a traffic jam. The hatefulness of the Nazis, for me, consists in forcing people to live under such conditions. In March 1938, Adolf Hitler marches into Austria. His arrival is greeted with wild cheers. Annexation to the German Reich also brings the National Socialist politics of extermination to Austrian soil. The search begins for a site for a possible concentration camp. The SS targets industrial locations in particular. A granite quarry in Upper Austria is chosen, Mauthausen. Seen here in 1934, before it is leased and later taken over by the SS. The SS wanted to have one big main camp in each region of the German Reich. This was the concept it had been following since 1936, and after the Anschluss, it was a case of having a separate main camp on Austrian soil. The purpose was to bring people there from the region in question, not from elsewhere, but from the region in question. Which is why immediately after the Anschluss, Gauleiter Eigruber announced publicly that the Upper Austrians were being given the honour of getting a concentration camp for the traitors of the people from all over Austria. That was the concept. Mauthausen shown here at its largest extent shortly after liberation, is for now the only camp classified as Grade 3, as a camp with the harshest prison conditions. It has two main functions, annihilating political and ideological enemies and maximizing exploitation of their labor. The first prisoners to arrive in Mauthausen in summer 1938 are from Dachau concentration camp and include a lot of Austrians. They fall under the anti-social campaigns. In the main, they aren't political prisoners, they haven't been taken there for political reasons, but instead as part of the arrest of marginal groups who are in the focus of the regime in this period. But very soon political prisoners do start arriving at Mauthausen. Prisoners are transferred to Mauthausen from across Europe. The admission process is documented by the SS in photographs. Grade 3, this means extermination through work. Disregarding even the most primitive safety precautions, granite was quarried here. The boulders weighed up to 50 kilograms that had to be carried out of the Wiener Graben quarry up the stairs of death to the top. Among other things, the granite is to be used for redeveloping the German cities, above all Linz, the Führer city, which is to undergo large-scale expansion and gain magnificent new buildings. Even so, it must be said that the majority of the granite, everything that was quarried, ended up in the construction industry or elsewhere. Um. There's another interesting aspect to this. The general building inspector for Berlin, Albert Speer, later the minister for armaments and very well known, helped to finance the construction of the Mauthausen concentration camp from his own departmental budget. 
There was such an interest in getting stone, and Speer was worried that with the build-up of arms and the economic boom, he wouldn't get enough stone, since the workforce was all being redirected into the arms industry. Therefore, we see a sort of coalition of interest between Berlin's general building inspector and the SS in building the concentration camp. Starting in 1934, the Dachau camp regulations are applied to all camps in the German Reich. Dachau, the first big concentration camp, a state in a state, cut off from the outside world, with its own laws, its own judges, and its own executioners. Violence is also part of everyday life in the camp. Attempts after the war to demonstrate conditions in the camp in all their atrocity resulted in these films, made in Belgium after 1945. Shown here some common forms of torture. Following the Dachau model, the Mauthausen camp is also to become a place of terror. The prisoners are deliberately humiliated by the SS. In July 1942, the Austrian prisoner Hans Bonarewitz attempts to escape from the concentration camp. The camp orchestra is forced to accompany the condemned man to his execution. The use of cruelty is deliberate and is staged for an audience. Mauthausen develops into a byword for terror. The concentration camp is also used as an execution site. In February 1941, there was a general strike in the Netherlands in protest over the occupation. And as a repressive measure, mass arrests were carried out, above all among the Jewish population. Some of them were deported to Mauthausen and murdered there in a very short space of time. It was really a case of taking revenge, and this was made known in the Netherlands, certainly as a deterrent. There are few surviving historical images from the time the camp was in operation that document the atrocities. A group of Spanish prisoners managed to smuggle photographs taken by the SS out of the camp. Mariano Constante and his friend Francisco Boyce were part of this action. At the meeting, I said that boys had offered to steal the negatives documenting the crimes of the SS, because they take photos of every execution. We won't get out of here alive. There's little hope of that. And the man in charge of the Spanish group, Rosola, who died last year from cancer, said to me, what? Of course that can help. Even if they kill all of us here, if we manage to hide these photos, then the human race will know what Mauthausen was. Here are pictures of building the camp at Fuklebruck, where, as I already said, there were just Spaniards. Here you can see the prisoners' barracks with barbed wire. And here they're carrying straw sacks on their backs. They're taking them to their barracks to sleep on. Here, on the far left. Berlado and I each carried about 300 negatives around with us for nine months under the shoulders of our prisoner uniforms. They were very thin. You didn't even know they were there. There were also 54 Spanish children. They left the camp to work in the Mauthausen quarry and live there. They were allowed to watch the SS playing football every Saturday. We exchanged information with them. One day they said to us, we know a woman, an Austrian, Frau Pointner. She's part of the Austrian resistance. Straight away we thought this was the best chance for smuggling the photos out, namely in the football boots of the SS. At the football pitch, they could be passed on to the boys while the SS men were playing football. The boys took the negatives to their camp in the quarry and then passed them on to Frau Pointner. From 1943 onwards, the prisoners, who now include women for the first time, are used as workers in the arms industry. 
From autumn 1943, to provide protection from air attacks, underground tunnels were built for the arms industry. And during construction of these underground complexes, which involved heavy mining work, death rates rose rapidly again. If you take a camp like the one near Melk, for example, where work on a tunnel complex started in April 1944, of the 15,000 prisoners who were assigned there, within 12 months 5,000 were dead, which shows how high the death rates were. The SS sets up a total of around 40 subcamps, for example at the Hermann Göring works in Linz. Forced laborers are a significant factor in the national socialist economy. In spite of this, the murders continue. Over the years, the killing becomes more mechanized. The SS builds an apparatus for shooting people in the back of the neck and brings industrial killing to Mauthausen in the form of the gas chamber. There were already killings using poison gas before this, but these didn't take place at Mauthausen. Instead, prisoners who were sick and unable to work were selected by a panel of doctors and sent to the Hartheim Killing Center, which originated as part of the Nazi euthanasia program, and they were asphyxiated there using carbon monoxide. So there is this killing already, but in Mauthausen itself, the systematized, mechanized mass murder, in fact, takes place from the beginning of 1942 onwards. One of the prisoners describes what happened. The victims for the gas were told either that they would be bathing or that they would be deloused. If the corpses had been in the gas chamber for some time, getting it cleared out was incredibly difficult because the corpses were bloated and in some cases completely knotted together. At least 3,500 prisoners were executed in the gas chamber, but the gas chamber was not the site of death on a mass scale. That was the infirmary camp, known as the Russian camp, located right next to the SS football pitch. Prisoners who were sick and unable to work were liquidated here. Towards the end of the war, the situation escalated dramatically. The period from the end of 44, beginning of 45 onwards, can only be described as the catastrophic phase of the Mauthausen concentration camp. In Mauthausen, Gusen and the 40 or so subcamps, over 90,000 people died in total between 1938 and 1945. Around half of this number applies to the months from the end of 44 until liberation, so to a very short space of time, which shows the kind of mass death taking place. 90,000 dead, shot, hanged, starved, industrially murdered in the gas chamber. This is the unimaginable result of the National Socialist terror. The victims were Roma and Sinti, Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, homosexuals, opponents of the regime, prisoners of war, men, women, the old and children. Every second person of the 190,000 people imprisoned at Mauthausen met their death here. The American soldiers who arrived at the concentration camp on the 5th of May 1945, after it had been abandoned by the SS, were witness to indescribable scenes. Thousands of prisoners continued to die in the weeks after liberation due to the catastrophic physical condition they were in. The dead were buried outside the walls of the camp by the residents of Mauthausen. With liberation, there is finally an end to the suffering for the camp's inmates. For those who are in power, for the members of the National Socialist regime, it means that they are now called to account for their atrocious crimes. The perpetrators had already been warned before the end of the war. In late April, the Allies had also dropped flyers over Mauthausen, threatening that for their crimes, the Nazis would be pursued and punished without mercy. Signed, Stalin, Truman, Churchill. During those final weeks, the SS deliberately has evidence destroyed. But at great personal risk, a few prisoners are able to save some pieces of evidence. This is the death register of the Mauthausen concentration camp, 
which was smuggled out of the camp by a prisoner in April 1945. With the liberation of the camp on the 5th of May, the Americans immediately start to secure the evidence. These films were made by the American soldier Ray Butch after he arrived in Mauthausen on the 10th of May 1945. Here's a view of the wall with the gun emplacements. And this is inside the main camp. And that's the kitchen again. This is the guard tower. And these are the Austrians, actually, in Austria, who are putting the dead in the graves. Investigations began immediately after liberation. There was an investigating team from the U.S. Army who collected materials and who immediately started questioning large numbers of witnesses, both perpetrators and victims, because the arrests started straight away as well. For example, there was a U.S. intelligence agent who in the last month, so from April, had been at Mauthausen as a prisoner himself, and he compiled a report that was ready by the end of May, a very comprehensive one. Witnesses are questioned, crime scenes photographed, documentary evidence collected. The American investigating team is seen here. This picture, taken by a prisoner, shows the hole in the wall left behind when the apparatus in the gas chamber was dismantled. Simon Wiesenthal, who was also liberated from Mauthausen concentration camp, gives a witness statement. And they gave me paper, ink, and a pen. They didn't have those biros yet, then. And within four days, I had written down the most important things I knew and what I thought might be interesting for this office, since it was concerned with justice for war crimes. After a week, I went in and I asked, have you read it? Yes, you're already on the team. However, most of the perpetrators had fled already before the Americans' arrival. Most of the perpetrators were arrested elsewhere, either at the front, because in the final days of the war, the Kampf Gruppe Oberdonner was formed to be the sort of last bastion against the Allies. So some were arrested there, and many had absconded, who were then simply caught later on. The former camp commandant Franz Zierreis is shot while on the run. Later, he is interrogated for several hours before dying from his wounds. Afterwards, some of the former prisoners hang his corpse on the camp fence in an act of symbolic retribution. The first big trial of 61 perpetrators from Mauthausen takes place between March and May 1946. It is held before an American military tribunal on the grounds of the former concentration camp at Dachau. In the courtroom of the Dachau camp, the trial began against 61 members of the Mauthausen concentration camp guard. The first session is attended by General Truscott. The defendants, among them 28 Austrians, are accused of inhuman acts of cruelty, which resulted in the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people. One of the main defendants is the former Gauleiter of Upper Danube, SS Obergruppenführer Eigruber. What is your full name? You know. August Eigruber. August Eigruber. How old are you? Wie alt sind Sie? 38 Jahre. What is your residence? Ihr wohnt es. Linz an der Donau. Linz on the Danube. What is your nationality? Your Staatsangehörigkeit? Österreicher. Austrian. Were you ever a member of the armed forces of the German Reich? Waren Sie jemals ein Mitglied der Streitkräfte des Deutschen Reiches? Yes, sir. No. The archive of the Mauthausen Memorial holds copies of all the Mauthausen trials held at Dachau. They are the source of a great deal of information on how those responsible were dealt with at the end of the war. There are about 60,000 pages of material in total. 
documents and photos, a large number of original documents from the time the camp was in operation, which were used as evidence. On the other hand, a large number of witness statements, which were taken immediately after the liberation of the camp, as well as the trial documents themselves, the cross-examinations and the witness testimonies. They were taken relatively soon after the war was over, which means that events were still fresh in people's minds. They could still remember all the details. And of course, as a historian, there's an incredible amount to be gleaned there. A key witness at the Dachau trials is Hans Marschalek. As the former camp clerk, he plays a major role in calling the crimes to account. In the sentences handed down by the Americans to the Mauthausen perpetrators, a total of 116 defendants are sentenced to death and 47 to life imprisonment. 86 death sentences are carried out. The vote was taken concurring, sentences you to death by hanging, at such time and place as our authority may direct. Eigruber is also sentenced to death. August Eigruber. August Eigruber, the former Gauleiter of Upper Danube, one of the main people responsible for the camp, in which alone from 1942 to the end of the war, 70,000 people died a violent death. Taken concurring, sentences you to death by hanging, at such time and place as our authority may direct. Gericht in geschlossener Sitzung und unter Zustimmung von mindestens zwei Dritteln der bei der Abstimmung anwesenden Mitglieder verurteilt sie zum Tode durch Erhängen. Zeit und Ort für die Vollstreckung werden von der höheren Militärbehörde bestimmt werden. In Austria itself, trials in the post-war years between 1945 and 1955 are held by so-called people's courts. Their task is to punish war crimes and violations of the Prohibition Act which is passed after the end of the war. 23,500 verdicts, including more than 13,600 guilty verdicts, are returned in the 10 years of the People's Courts. There are 43 death sentences, of which 30 are carried out. The People's Courts consisted of two professional judges and three lay judges, who came to a joint decision regarding guilt and punishment. The lay judges were nominated proportionally by the conservative, socialist and communist parties in order to make sure that no former Nazis were being smuggled in. The first People's Court trial takes place as early as August 1945. The defendants are members of the SA and party officials who, at a camp near Engerau and on death marches, shot dead over 100 Jewish forced laborers in 1945. 21 people stand accused. Nine are sentenced to death. Those involved in the so-called Mühlviertel Herrhund, when over 400 Soviet prisoners escaped from Mauthausen concentration camp and, with very few exceptions, were hunted down and murdered, are also found guilty by the people's courts. They were very serious and fair trials that were carried out here, with tough sentences to match, but you have to see it in stages. The toughest sentences, including the death penalty and life imprisonment, were handed down in the period from 1945 to 1948. After that, the sentences were somewhat more lenient. That the sentences soon become lighter is partly a result of the Cold War as the Allies, and especially the Americans, take an ever more lenient attitude toward former Nazis. In domestic politics, too, there is a tendency towards integrating former National Socialists back into Austrian society. A crucial political move comes in 1948, when many former Nazis regain the right to vote. Already in the 1949 elections, this has a significant effect. The elections in 1949 certainly marked a definite break in this immediate post-war period in connection with denazification and with how former National Socialists were dealt with. Former National Socialists were allowed to vote again for the first time since 1945 and, bear in mind, they represented, in terms of size, a group of over half a million people. Little by little, the prosecution of the perpetrators becomes weaker and less systematic. While 30 death sentences are carried out before 1948, 
after this date, not a single one is passed. In 1955, the celebrated Austrian State Treaty is signed. Austria is free. The Allies leave the country. Austria now takes sole responsibility for prosecuting the perpetrators. I think that 1955 certainly marked another break in this post-war history of National Socialism, although it's more or less a sort of full stop to a development that actually took place several years earlier. What's certainly very striking and important about the State Treaty is the fact that with the State Treaty, any external supervision, of course, now finally fell away, and Austria was now, as was proclaimed, really free, and the Austrians could now go about things as they'd always wanted. At the end of 1955, the people's courts are abolished and the prosecution of Nazi crimes handed over to jury trials. From this point on, the number of trials falls off rapidly. Then in 1957, there was a general amnesty for former National Socialists. This means that, at the latest, from this point onwards, as a former member of the Nazi party, there was very little reason to worry that something would happen to you. The last full trial in Austria ends in 1975. The trial of Johann Gogel, who is accused of several counts of murder at Mauthausen concentration camp. Several witnesses testify against Gogel, but there is little incriminating documentary evidence. Gogel himself pleads not guilty. Do you plead guilty to fact Roman numeral one, number one, regarding the case of the Allied paratrooper? No. You plead not guilty? I plead not guilty in all cases. Johann Gogel is ultimately acquitted by the jury. 1975 was the last verdict for Nazi crimes, and it was an acquittal. Of course, this was symptomatic of the politics of drawing a line under the past in the Second Republic. After the end of the war, Eastern Austria becomes part of the Soviet occupation zone, and so too Mauthausen with the former concentration camp. In 1947, the Soviets hand the site over to the Austrian government on condition that it becomes a memorial site and that a plaque showing the number of victims ordered by nationality is erected. Two years later, it is ready. The memorial site at Mauthausen opened in 1949. But already at the time of the opening, it was the subject of massive public criticism. You have to remember, here was a society that had been involved to a large extent in National Socialism. And the majority of the population had difficulty identifying with the history of this camp in such a way that they felt it was part of their own history. There were several calls from the media along the lines of, why isn't the money being used for something else? for reconstruction, and so on. In the period of economic boom, the Mauthausen Memorial, in comparison with the icons of reconstruction, is a neglected project. Running the memorial site is left to survivors of the camp. Among them are Frenchman Daniel Piquet-Audrin and his wife Michel. They start to organize tours of the site. On s'est aperçu qu'il y avait énormément de Français qui passaient en touriste. We noticed that a lot of French tourists came here and that there was absolutely nothing for them that could have explained life in the camp to them. They walked around as if they were walking around a cemetery and we realized that we had to do something. We had a meeting at the offices of the Survivors Association and they gave us the go-ahead. They said, if you want to organize tours, then do it. And that's how the tours started. And we did them for 20 years every summer. We set off with our children, even when they were still babies. We set off at the end of June, and at the beginning of September, we returned home. We lived in the camp, in the former commandant's office. 
I took care of welcoming the tourists, and my husband, when I was able to get enough people together to get a group, he took them on a tour of the camp. My name is Piki Audran. In the camp I was known as Mirador because I'm 1 meter 95 tall. In 1938 there was nothing here except the quarry. The first to suffer in this camp were the Austrians, followed by the Czechs, the Poles, then the Spaniards, the French. Overall, people from 21 countries lived in the camp at Mauthausen. When you see the roll call area, you can picture our arrival at the camp, and today there's something that former inmates find very surprising, namely seeing birds and butterflies flying over the camp. Not once during the war did a bird fly over the camp, and not once did you hear a bird sing. We remember the smoke from the crematorium all the more clearly instead. We learned very quickly what happened to our comrades who had died the day before. The Austrian government finally commissions an exhibition in the 1960s. It is clear that without any accompanying information, the barracks cannot convey a sense of what the conditions had been like. Hans Marschalek, himself a former prisoner at Mauthausen, is charged with the task. Hans Marschalek tried, together with his wife and with a few others who were actually helping him, to bring together documents that were scattered across Europe. Then he developed the exhibition that opened in 1970, and with the objects, with the research findings he had collected for it, he established the archive in Vienna. The concept behind the museum was to have an effect on young Austrians, Austrian students, etc. Above all, to have an effect on young Austrians, on the Austrian population, not the foreigners. It was a camp of foreigners, but the majority of Austrians didn't want to know anything about this period. You mustn't forget that many Austrian teachers had served in the German Wehrmacht. And even if they didn't commit any crimes, they still chose not to see or hear anything of the National Socialist crimes. These teachers, unsurprisingly, said almost nothing to their pupils until about the 60s about the barbarity of National Socialism. With the opening of the permanent exhibition, Mauthausen becomes one of the central places of remembrance in Austria for the victims of National Socialism. Every year, a ceremony commemorates the liberation. When we celebrate 70 years this year, the 70th anniversary of the liberation of Mauthausen, then it's the 70th liberation ceremony. The first liberation was celebrated on the day of the liberation by the survivors, who from that moment on organized themselves and held liberation ceremonies every year. It's thanks to their initiative and commitment that today we have these liberation ceremonies on this scale and with this tradition. In 2008, work begins on a comprehensive overhaul of the exhibition. No easy task. The site itself is part of the exhibition. In 2010, filmmaker Susanna Ayoub interviewed some of Mauthausen's residents. They talk about living in a place that is marked so strongly by a negative past. I was born right by the concentration camp, and I saw the first prisoners when they were brought from Dachau. Just imagine, on the 1st of May 1938, we started cutting down the wheat, the crops, and on September the 14th or the 15th, the first prisoners came from Dachau. 
The prisoners came along this street, over there. They marched from the station up to where the footpath goes to the concentration camp. The prisoners arrived in the camp on foot. Those who saw anything, if they saw anything, knew what took place there. A lot of people tried to go away, to not be on the street when a transport arrived. And so obviously people didn't really talk about him much. The occupation forces left and it became state property. But for such an internationally known place, Austria couldn't say, let's pull it down. They couldn't afford to take a piece of this history, this tragic history, and say, away with it, blow up the walls, raise it to the ground. Now they've taken it on board, and if it was so, we have to live with it, we have to maintain it, and bear the cost of it. There are people making a living from tourism, who are certainly pleased it's there, because it brings in business. I wasn't in Mauthausen at that time. I can only tell you what I've heard from others, from my older relatives who were living here. But I personally wasn't aware of anything, thank God. But it was terrible to hear what happened here. I was born in Mauthausen, but I wasn't aware of any of it because I'm too young. I'm 66 years old, so I really wasn't aware of it. I think it's depressing to have to watch every year how people come here and simply label the people of Mauthausen as bad. In my opinion, we shouldn't remember it anymore. It's over, as sad as it is, but it's over. No, we have to remember, especially for the young people, so that it never happens again. No, it doesn't make any sense. You know why? Because it just stirs up hatred. No, we have to remember, so that we don't have that kind of time again. That really would be terrible. Mauthausen has to live with its history, and with any unpleasantness this brings. It really bothered us that the Mauthausen power station wasn't built, for example. The Mauthausen Danube power station, it would have been where the river turns at Gusen. It was part of a chain and was suddenly axed and moved a couple of kilometers downstream. The name Mauthausen was certainly to blame, since the money was coming from the World Bank, and obviously it was a negative word. Mauthausen was certainly seen as negative. You know too how many Jews were killed there. I was a welfare pupil. Twice a week I got soup and the tattered books, which I couldn't learn anything from. We got them for free from the school. But after Hitler came, I wasn't a welfare pupil anymore, and as young people, of course, we were pleased, no question. Every opportunity was there. Hitler did a lot for young people, no question. The name Mauthausen definitely has a negative image. That's just how it is. Our mayor, for example, was arrested in Yugoslavia after the war when they heard he was from Mauthausen. Of course, they realized who he was and let him go. But we had been warned. I went abroad a lot on holiday and so on. I also never said I'm from Mauthausen. I also said Linz.
Everyone has their own experience of it. Everyone who lives in Mauthausen, everyone who was born in Mauthausen, went to school here, works here, has an experience of what it means. For example, to have the word Mauthausen as part of their address. Or that when you go on a school trip, then of course you're going to have to deal with the fact that the other children know exactly what it means when you say Mauthausen. On school trips, we were always the Katzetler. Even as small boys of 10, it was always that way. You have this stigma. I was born in 1975, 30 years after the end of the war. I wasn't involved in the history directly, and therefore we simply reacted against it by saying, it's nothing to do with us. With experience and with age, and when you're wiser, more knowledgeable, of course you deal with the topic in a different way. We have around 5,000 inhabitants, and there are still people in Mauthausen who say it would be better if the memorial didn't exist, because you always have to deal with the stigma. If you're abroad and you say you're from Mauthausen, that's often a negative experience. There are stories of people who've been visiting Israel, for example, on a pilgrimage, and they've been advised they're not to say they're from Mauthausen, because it might cause problems. There are no actual perpetrators in Mauthausen. But then you have to differentiate. Who is a perpetrator? The one who beats someone to death himself, or the one who turns away and doesn't prevent that person from being beaten to death? As mayor, you're also a direct successor to those who might have committed crimes. But that's part of our town. We are the town of the perpetrators and the town of the victims. The Mauthausen Memorial reopens in 2013 after a comprehensive overhaul. The underlying concept is designed to ensure a sensitive approach to the site. The gas chamber, seen here as it was when open to the public, is now closed off. It soon became very clear that we had to change something here. Now you can approach it from one side, but you can no longer go in. We also decided to preface this historically sensitive area with some content to prepare people, which means that no one enters these rooms now without a certain level of basic knowledge, without being prepared. It explains that death took place everywhere, in the infirmary camp, in the quarry, on the roll call area, from everyday conditions, working conditions, prison conditions, through torture, through arbitrary violence, through neglect. There were many, many sites of death, and that is what we are trying to communicate in this second exhibition. The objects in the exhibitions have been donated by survivors or their relatives from around the world. They tell not just the history of extermination at the concentration camps, but also that of survival. Standing for the crimes that were committed in all the subcamps, today Mauthausen is Austria's central place of remembrance. Liberation marked the return of some kind of normal life. Since then, it is a place that has continued to develop. That was a, for me. What makes it so special for me are the places of remembrance that have evolved here without any guidelines. Through the commitment of the survivors, the survivor organizations from other countries and even from each victim nation itself. Within the memorial site, we have three different commemorative areas. We have the area of national commemoration with the national memorials, that of collective remembrance along the Wailing Wall, where the different victim groups are remembered. And for me, a very moving place is the former Crematorium 3, where we have space for individual remembrance, where you see photos, where you see names, where candles and flowers were laid just today. It's where you can remember people individually, and this is something that is constantly growing. It's alive. Every day there's a little more. And for me, it's something unique that characterizes this place. Keeping remembrance alive for future generations. This will remain the task of the Mauthausen Memorial in future.